This is going to apply to every single property owner out there, right? You might think, hey, I don't have a property manager. I manage the property myself. This doesn't apply to me. You would be wrong because every single rental property owner has a property manager, right? Whether you hired another property manager or you're doing it yourself and you are the property manager, every one of these properties needs to be managed, right? Managing properties is the name of the game. You can't buy a property, put a tenant in there without some form of management, whether you hired another person or you're doing it yourself. Now, this property manager is often <coughs> this property manager is oftentimes doing something that is costing you money, right? You don't want that, right? The goal is to make money. That's the name of the game, right? That's what we're here for. We're here trying to make money. So today, I'm going to go over three things I see property managers doing that is costing them money, right? Costing you money, right? So maybe you're doing it yourself or you hired some schmo and he's doing it and he's costing you money. Let's go. All right, folks, we ain't gonna put a foot around. We're gonna get right into it, okay? And the first thing that property managers are doing that is costing money is projecting. I see people project all the time. See, you have to understand something about me and what I do, okay? And this is important, all right? So don't just think it's just a little brag. Yeah. Maybe it's a little humble brag because, you know, that's the name of the game. I got to show you all what I do. So then you want to work with my company, right? Uh, you know, there's no qualms about it, right? That is the purpose uh, of what you guys are watching on pretty much every type of uh, real estate related content show out there, right? This one is definitely not the exception, but I, just, I shoot it to you straight. Here's, here's, here's the deal, okay? I run a $75 million rental property portfolio, right? Uh, we do this in the Midwest where properties are very, very cheap, okay? And uh, the majority of our clients, like we have clients from all over the world, right? But like the biggest majority of our clients uh, that we deal with is oftentimes going to be wealthy people on the West Coast, right? We get a lot of wealthy investors, uh, especially from like California, right? Because California is a communist friggin' Yeah, you know, it sucks over there, right? So nobody wants to own rental property in California, right? So you get all these wealthy cats from California uh, who are buying cheap rental properties in the Midwest, okay? Like a lot of Section 8 stuff, right? Uh, so what we have is Holton Wise, we're here in the middle. And on one side of the aisle, uh, we have like a wealthy person who lives on the West Coast. And then on the other side, uh, we have somebody on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, right? A Section 8 tenant uh, from Ohio, okay? There are not two types of people uh, who are any more different than that, okay? Uh, in running this company, uh, dealing with thousands of tenants, uh, hundreds upon hundreds of investor clientele, uh, we're in the middle, right? We're dealing with wealthy Californians and very low income folk in Ohio, right? So these two types of people, could it be any more different, okay? And we understand that. And a lot of property managers do not though, right? They project things that make sense to them onto the tenant base. And you can't do that, folks. That is the biggest mistake. Whether you're managing your own property as like a wealthy investor, you have to understand as a wealthy investor, you, you have such a different life experience, outlook on life. You're looking at life through such a different lens uh, than your tenant. So if you're projecting your emotions onto a situation, your thoughts onto a situation, you have to understand that that person is not going to see it uh, the same way. And that goes for a lot of, like, conflict, right? A lot of conflict, people arguing about this or that, or, like, uh, situations where, like, a common one, right? Tenant clogs a toilet, okay? Uh, and then the landlord is thinking about this, like, well, 
it says in the lease that they're responsible to pay for this, so it's a non-issue. And then they don't really understand how it actually plays out in the real world with that tenant, who A, probably has no idea that's in the lease, B, doesn't care that it's in the lease, uh, C, is going to be madder than a freaking angry hornet's nest at that investor. And, like, they just don't see eye to eye on situations like that, right? Like, in situations like that, investors project, like, uh, their thoughts of like, well, if I signed a contract and I did something like that, I would know it's my responsibility to pay for it, and I would just pay for it because that's what I would do. That's that's what your wealthy folk in California seem to think. Uh, your Section 8 tenant in Ohio, they don't fucking think that way, uh, and they don't see it the same way you do, bro. And oftentimes, you're going to run into issues where the landlord will try to do that. The tenant thinks the landlord's taking advantage of them. And that could lead to like an unnecessary turnover, right? It just creates unnecessary problems, right? Uh, so in scenarios like that, oftentimes it's more profitable for the landlord uh, to just eat the cost, uh, pay a plumber, do a little service call, fix it up, this or that, right? Even if, right, like it is 100% the tenant's fault you know, projecting on there that like, oh, well, we hired a professional. He determined it was the tenant's fault. The tenant's not going to believe you, right? You have to understand, right? They're not seeing things the same way as you are, right? They don't have like a level of trust uh, with their landlords, right? If you guys have paid attention to the news media uh, ever in your entire life, <laughs> landlords are not the most loved people, right? So you have to understand. Uh, don't project uh, your viewpoint of the world onto these people because theirs is drastically different. They don't usually like you, nor do they trust you, right? So you need to have property managers that understand and know that, right? Another form of projection uh, is projecting things that you like. Should never be doing that, right? You're investing in real estate. Uh, you pick a house. You decide to remodel the house. Do not do any types of remodeling projecting what you like like oh i really like this color this is a great color no 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 it's not what we do you ain't living in the house dog the tenants living in the house so you never want to project your personal preferences on these houses right instead what you want to do is use actual data right contact the biggest paint supplier in your area and ask them what the most popular skew is, right? If there is a number one selling skew of interior paint, guess what color every single one of your rental properties needs to be? That color. If it's not your favorite color, like you love turquoise blue, but turquoise blue is like number 50 on the list of top 59 colors, that ain't the right move. Play a pick number one every single time, right? So projecting our life experiences, projecting things that we like, never a good idea. You can't do it as a self-managed landlord. You damn sure can't hire a property manager who's not as sophisticated enough to understand that, right? That's the thing with people hiring property managers, right? If you get large property management companies, you start working with them, they usually have these like systems in place and things of that, but things of that nature, right? But in this business, you see a lot of just mom and pop shops popping up and people trying to get into this space to make some side income. You Sometimes you're going to see real estate agents trying to make side income, things like that. And they're just like you and I, they're just regular human beings and they're very guilty of making these poor decisions, right? So projecting is number one. And then number two, kind of piggybacking off of that, is making decisions based on your emotion, right? Making emotional decisions. We cannot utilize our emotions when we're making decisions. We have to make decisions based on numbers, based on facts, based on long-term returns, right? It can go back uh, to the plumbing issue, right? Oftentimes, right, in that same scenario, right, tenant and landlord, they both don't see the, the, the toilet clog the same way, right? So landlord, sometimes you get landlords uh, or property managers that do this on behalf of their landlord clients. They will try to hunker down like, no, the lease states that they will pay, so they're going to have to pay because it's right. Okay, sure. From like a moral perspective, I get it. You're digging in. It's the principle of the matter, right? But are you here to get right or are you here to get rich? I myself got into real estate to get rich, okay? I gave up being right 
a long time ago, right? So at Holton Wise, we don't make decisions with our portfolio based upon emotions the majority of the time. Now, there is a caveat to that, right? Uh, when you've done this as long as I have and you've built up a portfolio as big as we have, uh, you do eventually get to a point where you have something called fuck you money. And then you could make decisions based on emotions because you have fuck you money and you know damn well you're doing it uh, for the wrong reason, but somebody pissed you off and you just feeling like a prick and uh, you want to hammer them, okay? Uh, I have definitely done that, right? I'm, not, I'm guilty of, of doing that every now and again. But the difference is uh, I had to work for many, many, many years building this business not making emotional decisions to get to the point where I had the luxury of making an emotional decision. But anytime I do utilize an emotional decision based upon the premise of fuck you money, I comprehend that that is not necessarily a correct business decision. Uh, that is just a business decision uh, based upon luxury because I built such a good business, right? So I'll do that with my own rentals. Uh, but like when we're managing properties, uh, for clients, right? We have fiduciary responsibilities to play it by the book and not make emotional decisions. And you guys better make sure your property managers are doing the same. And if you're managing your own properties, you better do the same till you get to the luxury of being able to make those emotional decisions at the detriment of your business. But I guess it doesn't matter at that point, right? So back to the task at hand, right? The original example, right? This toilet, right? This clogged toilet. So the Owner, investor, landlord, PM, they want to hunker down like, if you don't pay this $150, you have to. It's in the lease. You have to pay it. And the tenant's like, no, I'm not going to pay it. So then what do you do, Mr. Landlord? What do you mean they're not going to pay it? They're not They're not going to pay it, bro. They don't want to pay the 150 They said they're not fucking paying it. All right, well, what are my options to make them pay it? Well, you could uh, pay it yourself, pay the 150 keep it moving, collect their $900 in rent next month and the next month and the next month and the next month and the next month. Uh, or you could uh, pay, I don't know, between like one and $5,000 to evict them, lose rent, pay a leasing fee, and turn their unit. What makes sense, right? It's right. Yeah, they should probably be paying for it. The lease says so. It's in a contract between two adults. But do you want to lose $150 and then keep it moving, keep the gravy train coming? Or do you want to lose like between one and $5,000 going through the long process of evicting them when you could have just ate the 150 and kept it moving, right? In this business, guys, you and your property managers need to understand that there's going to be a cost to doing business and you're going to have to eat a little bit of crap here and there to keep things moving, right? That's just how the game works, right? So don't be that guy or gal getting caught making emotional decisions. If you're hiring property managers, don't don't let them do that, right? Don't let them die on those hills for you, okay? And then the last thing is being inefficient, man. Inefficiency is something uh, that is is uh, is a pandemic in the real estate industry, man. Uh, inefficiency is something that will cost people so much money. And I see this time and time again with these little pop-up shops, one-man operations, right? Property managers that are just so inefficient, that property managers that don't have systems, right? How many times have you guys heard about the landlord or the property manager that's complaining that the tenants are calling or texting them? at all hours of the day for like dumb stuff right like ah it's 11 p.m on a saturday night why are you texting me about this stupid thing susan ah these tenants are horrible and they want to pull out their hair right i mean i've been a property manager for over 10 years that's why i don't have any fucking hair uh but eventually i figured out how to be efficient right when i first started my business yeah the cell phone uh, was was the number you gave out. The cell phone was how everything happened. And uh, I was inefficient, right? I would be speaking to people uh, at inappropriate times, right? And that's wrong. You can't do that. You can't scale and run a profitable business if you're inefficient. And part of being efficient is creating processes and systems, processes and systems that have rules, right? So, Tenants should not be able to get a hold of the property manager uh, for non-urgent things 24-7, 
right? You go to any other business, there are business hours, and then there's times when it's closed, right? As a property manager, you need to do the same. You need to set your own business hours. Maybe they're 10 a.m., to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, maybe they're 9 to 5. I don't know what your hours are going to be, but you need to set your own hours and stick to them. Now, there's a caveat to that. Of course, you need to set up some type of emergency channel so the tenants can reach you during an emergency. But even that, folks, that is honestly a little overblown, right? You get the people uh, that are out there, they'll be like, yeah, yeah. I tell my tenants, don't call me unless the house is on fire. Motherfucker, I don't know about you, but I don't own a fire truck. Why are you calling me at 2 a.m. on a Sunday because the house is on fire? I don't got a fucking fire truck. I can't put that shit out. Call 911, bro. Most (laughs) emergencies uh, are really going to be solved by, you know, emergency services, right? 911 is really going to take care of most of your emergencies. Now, of course, we got, like, some plumbing plumbing issues so you need to have set up an emergency maintenance right system put that in place right so in that type of emergency they could reach out right but other than that there are going to be no emergencies right they're going to be things that tenants think are emergencies and if your inefficient ass placates them you are never going to make the money you should be making in this business if your property manager placates them they're never going to be able to turn this property into the profitable rental property it should if you're going on and on and on and on right because when you're dealing with tenants right it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, right? The life experiences of investors and tenants are so much different, right? Uh, oftentimes, when you get into some of these low-income tenant situations, the tenant like has this feeling or this notion that the landlord is, I don't know if I want to say a parent, but it, sometimes it can feel like they're trying to develop that type of relationship or maybe like some type of authority relationship where it's like they view them almost like a teacher or a principal uh, from school, And, you know, they think that every situation should be resolved by the landlord, right? You got a multi-unit building. They get into an argument uh, with another tenant. They think they can just go to the landlord and tell tell on them to the landlord. Like, bro, the landlord's not your dad. It's not your teacher. It's not your principal. Like, you guys are two grown adults. You live next to each other. Figure it out. Like, uh, you know, people, we see situations where, like, One tenant is parked in a way that has blocked another tenant in, and the tenant will call the office and complain about it. And the first question our staff will ask is, well, did you ask the other person to move their car? No, I didn't do that. Why don't you just go knock on their door, right? Uh, These people, uh, they really just try to make their problems your problems right it comes up with rent right oh i don't have all the rent because of x y and z right if you're a person who's constantly going back and forth talking to them they feel like every little wave in their life becomes your business and it's not and if you're spending all of your time going back and forth with these people letting all of their uh issues and and wavelengths become your issue you're never able to spend enough time actually having a profitable business okay you have to understand that like you know ah i don't have all the rent i only got this much rent because i had to do this and my car broke down and this this and this and this and you're like okay well you know you just pay me what you have now and we'll get the rest no don't do any of that hey Rent's $800 a month. It's due on the first. Have a good day. Bye. Right? And then if they they pay, they pay. If they don't, they get evicted. Right? And guess what? Oftentimes when you give them an eviction notice, these people that claim they only had like half the money, they always find a way to come up with the rest of it. Right? Because they have like a finite amount of cash and they have things they want to buy. If you allow yourself to be that thing that like kind of moves and plays and that's the one thing that doesn't have to get paid in full, you're the one that's going to get taken advantage of all the time. You know who doesn't do that? Utility companies, right? Like, if you don't pay uh, the electric bill in full, electric gets turned off. So guess what they do? They pay that in full, right? You don't pay Verizon. Verizon shuts off your service. Same way with landlords, right? So don't be inefficient, right? Uh, Verizon doesn't uh, get on the phone with you and and talk to you about your boyfriend and this or that or all this, right? And you get the boyfriend-girlfriend thing. They're always fighting, and then you'll get calls. Oh, he did this, this, and this. I want him to move out. Can you make him move out? You can go with all that. You know, as landlords, you got to be efficient. You got to be like, look, you're both on the lease. 
Ren is due on the first. If Ren isn't paid, everybody on the lease gets an eviction on the record, right? Things like that. You don't try to step in and uh, referee domestic disputes. I see people do that all the time. You ain't a social worker, folks. You are a property manager, so do not get yourself involved, right? Uh, so many other various ways of being inefficient that I see. How about rent collection? You know what the most inefficient way to collect rent is? Physically going to the property and picking up cash. Oh, not only is that insanely inefficient, it is wildly dangerous, right? You don't do that, right? You don't walk up to the property, knock on the door, and grab yourself a wad of sweaty titty 20s, okay? That is not the move. You as a landlord need to set up a way that these tenants can pay you, and that's it, right? Whether that way is direct deposit, it's mailing a money order, it's paying online, the decision is yours, folks. It's not like, oh, well... I don't know how to do that, so here's a bunch of sweaty titty 20s. No, it's not how it works. We don't accept sweaty titty 20s for various reasons, right? Mostly danger, a little bit of hygiene, and most importantly, well, danger is probably most important, but like second, secondly, that's inefficient. You can't just be driving around, right? The payment needs to come. If the payment isn't made, they get evicted, right? It goes back to the utility companies, right? You don't get to... Dick around with your electric company with a bunch of crinkled up sweaty titty 20s. No, no, no. You got to pay the invoice and that's it, right? So you guys need to be efficient with your communication. Be efficient uh, with your rules, your procedures. Be efficient with your availability. You got to set up your systems and do these things over and over and over again. And then another thing too, right? Like with your maintenance, Right? Be efficient. Do every one of your apartments the same. We already talked about you're not going to use emotional decisions to determine the type of fixtures and colors you utilize in your apartments. So this is very easy to do the same, right? Because you've already gone to your local supplier and asked for the most popular things in the price range you're trying to hit. And now you just repeat that process every single time you do another rental, right? I don't want you looking at it like, oh, you know, I understand we did the last six uh, in this particular color, but, you know, this is really going to pop off of this window. No! Be efficient. Same thing across the board, folks. That is how you'll make money, right? These are the three things property managers do wrong, and it costs them money. If you guys have any more, drop them in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.